Hello, and welcome to the Soundstage Audiophile Podcast. In this second season of the show, host Jordan Guth is joined by a new guest each episode who knows something about hi-fi that Jordan doesn't. And who knows, while he's learning about all of this, you might learn something too. So with no further ado, here's Jordan and this week's guest. Hello, and welcome to the Soundstage Audiophile Podcast. Today, we have Livio Kukuza, Chief Design Officer at Sonos Faber to talk about the new Suprema speaker system. We also have Doug Schneider, founder of Soundstage Network with us uh, to come into the conversation and help with a little bit more of the technical deep dives. So welcome, gentlemen. Hello, Jordan. Hello, hello. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for joining us, Livio. And I'm really happy to say that you're actually in the same time zone as us. So this is not like super early or super late for you in the day. I'm in New York right now. At the beautiful new Macintosh townhouse? Yes, in one of our uh, listening rooms, uh, which is called uh, the disco room. And I think there is an explanation for that. <laughs> yeah, not, the people listening to this can't see it, but there's a light show going on behind Livio, which is the coolest thing ever. So it puts us in a really good mood uh, for this recording. <laughs> so um, I don't want to take up too much time. We have Doug with us, and Doug is going to kind of ask some more technical questions about the new speaker system that was just released. Um, I might interject here and there just out of my own curiosity. And then afterwards, I'd love to talk to you about kind of what this means for Sonos Faber as a whole and, and kind of more of the, the marketing side of things and um, maybe the things that aren't as technical revolving around this project of yours. So without further ado, Doug, hit us off. Yeah, so this speaker was released about a week ago or so in Las Vegas. And I was kind of disappointed that everyone, it seemed, who covered it never asked any technical questions about it. They asked about the price. They might have put the height. They might have put the finish. But no, everybody just said, oh, here's Sonus Faber's new, well, million-dollar speaker system because it was shown with Macintosh Electronics. But when something like this comes out, I, I, I want to dive deeper into it. And in talking to Livio separately, which is why this podcast came to be, really, I said, I want to ask you the tough questions that nobody asked because you're claiming that this is technically advanced. It's not just an expensive speaker for the hell of yep. it, right, Livio? That's what um, you're saying. Um, as you know, Doug, uh, you uh, you visited us, I think, the last time was, uh, what, three years ago? About that, Maybe yeah. More. Yeah. yeah. Uh, as you know, and as you noticed, uh, back then we, we, we had a, uh, a little revolution in the Sonos Faber R&D, um, years ago. And, uh, we, we hired new engineers. We, 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 we built new listening rooms, new testing rooms. We have new equipments. Um, and so the, uh, the level of, uh, of, uh, of know-how, uh, increased a lot. I mean, we passed from, uh, um, five people to 15 in the last years in the R&D department. Um, and so, uh, we felt the need to, um, uh, to, to think about our technologies and start over with a new, uh, process of, uh, uh inventing new stuff and, uh, revising new stuff, uh, uh the, the, the stuff we had. Um, and, uh, and this is the reason why, uh, at one point we decided to, um, collect all these ideas and create, uh, uh the most amazing product possible. Out and this it. is the Suprema. And so and for people who haven't seen it, I, I recommend they go to your webpage, sonusfaber.com. Cause that's what I'm looking at right now. And so I'm going to ask you questions and it's basically a subwoofer satellite system, but not really a satellite, big floor standing speaker with yes. one or two subwoofers. And then you can either get it with two subwoofers for $750,000 in the US or one subwoofer for $680,000. Okay, two speakers and a sub. And I think most people are going to go with the two sub approach. But regardless, why is it designed with a separate subwoofer section or sections and floor standing speakers? Um, Many of the flagships from other companies are coming with a single giant, you know, left and right speaker. This is a two piece left and right speaker or right. left and right speaker in a single up. What was the idea? I know why I would create a yeah. speaker uh, subsystem, but what was your idea? 
Well, there are uh, many reasons why we did uh, we did that, and uh, it appears like the the only way to do it uh, from the beginning. Um, first of all, you know that uh, uh, our head of research right now, Mario, uh, you met him, I think, uh, yes. the big guy in the R and D. Uh, he's coming from the pro audio world. He he was designing uh, pro audio drivers for uh, like twenty years. And when we uh, we hired him, uh, the first thing that he wanted to well, he wanted to really add to the uh, Sonos Faber um, know how was his uh, um, knowledge about uh, very high performance drivers, especially the drivers that uh, are uh, responsible for the bass range. And uh, when he approached the um, the theme of doing uh, the most uh, uh, incredible loudspeaker, of course, uh, the the bass section was the the the, the part that concerned us the most because Sonus Faber is always was always perceived as the beautiful voice you know the f- very refined mid high uh, but never had these uh, um, 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 these um, warp and uh, bass yeah exactly um, so the first ideas that he, he put it on the on the on the table were pretty uh, ambitious. I mean, the uh, subwoofer of uh, Suprema is composed by two 15-inch drivers, and each 15-inch driver uh, was designed by him with this uh, idea in mind of being completely uh, without compromises uh, just to give you an idea the 15 inch of suprema can uh, can push up to 70 kilo in force which mean my weight uh, uh, and uh, and we have four of them uh, so when uh, when we, we 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 saw the first prototype and we test the first prototype that thing was generating an amount of energy that was uh, really impossible to um, to control in a, only one uh, box. Um, second second uh, reason was that uh, um, if you want to obtain a very flat response uh, down to uh, we are declaring fifteen hertz, but we can really flat. 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 Uh, if you want to obtain that frequency in a room uh, and, and you want to merge perfectly the, the main column with the subwoofer, there is almost no way that uh, you will be able to place them in the same position. Uh, because uh, the, 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 the base, as we know, uh, performs well in a different uh, uh, position in the speaker where, while you want to maintain the mid eye section where uh, it performs the better in terms of image uh, reconstruction, so soundstage reconstruction. So the traditional reasons to go to a speaker subwoofer system, optimize the speakers for their positioning and the subwoofer like positioning for that's tonality, imaging yes. and stuff, and the subwoofer or subwoofers for bass performance. Yeah, just to give an example, in our listening room, the, the two uh, subwoofers performs uh, almost perfect in the corners, uh, while in Vegas we weren't we weren't able to place the, the subs in the corner because the the the, the room was a was an hotel room and the, the, the walls are, were not solid enough to have the subwoofers so close to that. I saw that. Any pictures out of Vegas, they were near to the speakers. Near to the speaker. And that was the, 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 the most uh, reasonable position for them. But that's not always the case, right? So uh, I think if you want to build a no compromise system, you need to have that versa- versatility. Now, this flies in the face of... Uh, the idea of a speaker subwoofer system is is pr- very common in home theater. It's very common in in uh, inexpensive systems. Uh, Dennis, who produces the podcast, loves two point one systems for exactly that reason. Place the sub optimally. Like, so you've brought this into state of the art system. Now, the subwoofer or subwoofers they're not powered, right? There's an active no. crossover, but you need to. I'm looking at the spec sheet here. You need to add your own power amplifier for the subwoofer. 
Yeah, this is another thing that we thought was uh, was missing uh, in the solutions uh, um, available uh, out there when we when we, we we talk about this range of uh, of speakers. Um, the one easy solution for us was to uh, you know empower the woofers with a class D ton of watts. Uh, small, small enclosure, um, no problems, right? But the, the, the reality is that uh, if you really want to have the right tonality out of uh, also the, the very low uh, frequencies, you have to uh, be coherent with the amplifiers you are using in the main, uh, in the main columns. So we, we wanted to give... Uh, to the customer the possibility to play uh, to play with it, uh, and so we decided to go old-fashioned passive uh, uh, passive subwoofer, so the customer can choose to have uh, uh, any kind of uh, amplifier they prefer. Um, maybe it's the same brand of uh, the main columns, or maybe not. This is up to them. Um, and of course, to, to achieve that result, we had to build an external active crossover, which is pretty special also. So before the speaker and the subwoofer, there's a crossover that splits the signal at line level base and then higher frequencies. And then you put your subwoofer amplifier for each subwoofer, if you have two of them, after the crossover, and then the subwoofer itself drives the drivers directly, right? There's no other crossover components between it and the and the drivers in the sub, right? Crossing over is done ahead of yep. it. Yeah, subs are mainly uh, the the two woofers are uh, connected in parallel to the binding post, so there is nothing in the middle of. And so these drivers, I wasn't going to talk about them, but you said something interesting that uh, Mario put a lot of effort. They're special fifteen inch drivers. They're good, are they? Seven hundred fifty thousand dollar system. <laughs> They're not off the shelf. What are they? Of course, they are not off the shelf. Um, they are using a very powerful neodymium motor, uh, on the back of them. We, um, we, uh, completely redesigned the membrane and the membrane is a um, sandwich cone made out of, uh, uh, forged carbon fiber and, uh, and Rochel. Uh, that solution for us was the most, uh, um, indicated for that uh, for that type of work where the woofer is a pure piston and you need uh, you need just uh, brutal brutal force carbon fiber is one of the best it's light and have and uh, and uh, and strength um, the, the suspension uh, uh, itself was uh, redesigned for our scope it's a long uh, excursion suspension and it's a mix of rubber and foam um because most of those big uh, uh long excursion suspension made out of only rubber to us was uh, were sounding a little bit mm, plastic uh, I, I don't know how how to to translate that but uh not right this, yeah not right uh, that that rubber finishing was a little bit uh, um tasteless was uh, uh, and so we, we, we developed that, that uh, suspension for the woofer. Um, uh, so, I, and again, everything about that woofer is not common to the IFA industry. Uh, in fact, the, uh, the uh, supplier who is producing that woofer is normally a supplier that produces a big woofer for PA systems. Okay. And so you said this is supposed to go down to 15 hertz. Add what kind of SPL? can people expect in the base? Oh, well, that's, uh, <laughs> that's difficult to say. It's, uh, um, we measured in our, in our listening room, uh, uh, up about 120, but honestly, that's not the limit of the woofer. Uh, of course we designed the subwoofers to have plenty of headroom, uh, the, 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 the main column will go in crisis before that. Okay. Okay. So let's, let's move on to the speaker and the speaker is designed to always have at least one sub, right? You're not, yep. you know, you don't design, you don't expect anybody's going to buy two speakers and no sub, right? And we designed the system to be, uh, 
uh, t- two columns plus a woofer. So we we are not offering the possibility to buy the speakers with us. Okay, so let's let's talk about this speaker now. When I look at big speakers, because I'm really into speakers, and I see as many companies grow their speakers, many people think bigger is better, but bigger isn't sometimes better because suddenly you're taking up a lot more space, you're making a lot more drivers work together, and you can introduce a lot of problems. Okay, but yep. let's let's talk about looking at this thing acoustically. Now, it's got front and rear drivers. I'm just going to deal with the front drivers. It's got yep. two woofers on the top and two woofers on the bottom that all look the same. I I assume that these woofers come in above the subwoofer, and they all operate over the same frequency range. Correct. The four woofers uh, were designed to to have an array of 18-inch woofers, so not huge diameter, because what we really want to achieve in the main column was uh, the speed and the the impact of the uh, mid-bass, in particular, uh, bass and mid-bass, where uh, if you don't have to perform long excursion, you can concentrate the performance of the driver in the uh, reproducing uh, the, the, the impact, the slam so these operate all together for them for the base right. range do they behave kind of like one giant woofer yes uh the the idea was to um uh to approximate the system to a big coaxial uh, system so you have the giant woofer outside and then the mid base and mid range and tweeters in the middle yes. okay so then you've got what you've called above the two woofers in the bottom you've got another woofer Yep. And you're calling this a link woofer. Yep. And this is a four and a half way system. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. I'm guessing yes. here that this woofer is the only one that transitions to the mid range above it. And it's a four and a half way system because it operates in frequency above the four woofers, but it probably also contributes to the base too. That's my guess. Perfectly correct, Doug. Uh, it's uh, that, that driver was the most difficult one. Honestly, okay. Uh, to because we um, uh, we will talk about the mid range, which is probably the most special driver in the project. But uh, to to keep that mid range clean enough uh, to approximate the performance of the system uh, to a pure two way design, which we are famous for, uh, we 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 had to uh, we had to eliminate the, the mid base from, from the mid range and, and move that portion of frequency to another driver. The four woofers weren't, uh, weren't, uh, good to perform, uh, that, uh, uh, portion of the f- frequencies, because as we said, they are operating like a giant woofer and we, we didn't want to have a gigantic, uh, male voices. Right. Um, so the, uh, the, the reason why we did this link driver is exactly to create, uh, uh progression between the, 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 the mid range and the four woofers. The problem though, was that, um, uh, uh, applying an, an high pass and a low pass to that woofer, we were modifying too much the relative phase of that particular driver. And at that point was almost impossible to align the performance of that drivers to the other four. So you let uh, it run down into the other four. So to we, left, we left him playing also the bass frequencies which was uh, probably one of the, the, the most uh, critical uh, uh, challenges because uh, he has to handle basically the same power that uh, the four woofer are handling. In fact, as you can notice on the front of, uh, of, uh, of the main column, the um, dust cap of that woofer is bigger than the other ones. Yeah, the, I noticed that. The coil has to, has to uh, deal with a lot of energy. And just to throw my two cents in, so I got that right. This is a good idea because like I said, when I see some of these big tower speakers, the drivers start getting spread out. And there's another big tower speaker where the they got an upper bass module, two of them, and they're very far away from the mid-range driver. And to me, that's going to probably cause a lot of transition problems in the mid-range. You really want it close to the mid-range that it's passing off to. And then also in the vicinity of the woofers too. So you got four woofers doing the lowest frequencies 
And then this link woofer transitioning to the mid-range plus doing the bass frequency. So now let's talk about that mid-range and high frequency section, which is all in the center. So by the way, for people, that's why it's a four and a half way. When when something's a half way, it means it's not fully crossed over. So it's crossed over to the mid-range, but left to run full in the bass. All right. I'm glad you answered that, Doug, because that was on my mind. Yeah, so when you have a two and a half way, when you have a two and a half way, Jordan, what happens is you get uh, usually two uh, mid-range woofers uh, and a tweeter, say, and only one of the mid-range woofers is handing off to the uh, tweeter and the other one's running down the base. It's not a true three way. You know what I mean? It's that sort of thing. So it's a thing. So but now we got three discrete drivers in the middle section that transition from i just want to look at your crossover frequencies i'm guessing from 1700 hertz up or so right no so from 430 the, hertz up exactly the mid-range start at 430 430 okay so you got this mid-range let's talk about the highest frequency drivers first because those are the most interesting to me and our producer yeah. dennis berger has a question so at the very top of the end you've got a 20 millimeter silk dome super tweeter yep. that's running from 6700 hertz upwards yep and that is working with a 38 millimeter i don't know what that is in inches one and a half inches something like that um is that one and a half inches? I don't know. 38 millimeters. Um, so less than an inch and bigger than an inch tweeter. It's one operate, and a half. How much? One and a half. Why did you decide to go with a super tweeter and tweeter when many just go with just a tweeter? And why are they both silk domes? And I noticed they both have waveguides. Um, multiple reasons also here. Uh, first of all, the goal of the project was to uh, go up to 40 kilohertz. And uh, that uh, range was uh, was very difficult to be reached with a single uh, silk dome tweeter because of course the silk uh, is a soft material and when you go up in frequencies they need to be controlled in the in the uh, deformation of the membrane and this is the reason why we use the DAD system on the uh, regular speakers we are uh, we are doing but with the DAD uh, uh, system we were able to arrive uh, up to 30 kilohertz but never, never went above that. And just um, to, to, to clarify, I can see Jordan looking confused there. DAD is damped apex dome, right? Yep. And it, it's damped a system where you dome. hold the, the, the point, the, the farthest point of the dome in place and the other move around it to kind of, I think it's, I think it's uni- keep uniform shape of the uh, tweeter itself or something like yeah, that. Yeah, it's, uh, it's about what, what happened is that the, 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 the apex of the dome act uh, in, uh, in, uh, uh, antiphase when, uh, you go up, uh, in the frequency. And so there is a, a natural cancellation based on the, uh, on the shape and the, uh, in the material of the dome. Um, with a smaller uh, diaphragm, we were able to arrive to 40 kilohertz. So we decided to to go that way. Uh, and the second reason why we was decided to, to to do two tweeters is because we are known uh, for for natural materials. We didn't want to go uh, in searching for a different uh, material than silk because it's the material that we prefer in that range of uh, frequencies. Um, so we decided to split the two. Um, the, the third reason is that we made uh, in the last years some experiment and, uh, and research around the dome uh, mid-ranges. Uh, and we uh, discovered that um, uh, something that we really like uh, in the dome mid-range is the ability to uh, create a beautiful dispersion, especially uh, in the upper mid-range. Uh, so the, the the reason why we have a bigger dome there is to um, to have the, that beautiful dispersion in the upper mid range to high frequency range, uh, which uh, only a, a dome can do. And so let me you got, so you've got and you know I'm a fan of dome mid ranges because I'm a fan of this other speaker on the market that uses dome <laughs> mid range really well. So and I wasn't really thinking about that, but that's a good point. But the super tweeter, let's just go back to that. You say it can extend higher. Is that because the silk dome is stiffer because it's a smaller size than if it were a bigger size? 
No, it's just because the the the, the um, uh, silk is uh, so soft. Then when you want to produce a bigger dome, uh, you have to dump the silk in uh, some way to don't uh, you know create distortion in the membrane. And when you dump the the silk, uh, you uh, automatically cut the the high frequencies. So when you go with smaller size, you can uh, you can leave the silk uh, uh, free from any damping, and uh, at that point the dome can perform uh, very high high frequencies. Oh, so it's not a coated silk dome; it's a straight up silk dome. It's coated, but it's not heavy coated like the okay. bigger one. Okay, okay. So you got those two silk dome tweeter and super tweeter. And then you've said just a few minutes ago, the mid range, the six and a half inch mid range is the most special driver in this system. This is something yeah. new. Tell, yeah. I don't know anything about it other than it's got a dual driver motor system with neodymium yeah. ring magnet. Yeah. Um, the mid-range is the most important part of uh, the spectrum, uh, not only for us. It's, uh, I think, is that the component that all the hi-fi industry uh, always uh, glorified the most uh, because it's responsible of that uh, portion of the frequency where our human ears are more sensitive. Um, so if you want to, if you want to really, um, create something that is, uh, high resolution, but also, uh, not unnatural, uh, you have to play with the, um, the limit of every material you are using. So, um, we wanted to use paper because that's, uh, our core material, our core DNA. And the reason why it's uh, completely white because it's uh, we, we wanted to keep the paper uh, as natural as possible. Uh, it's still a mix of different uh, fibers, of course. It's not just plain paper. Um, but the the uh, the two innovation in uh, in that mid range are uh, first of all the cone uh, is not circular, as you can see. Um, it has five cuts. Uh, these cuts are not new to the market. Uh, this is a patent coming from uh, Vifa back in the day, uh, which was... Um, oh, around the... I didn't notice that. Around the... Um, circumference around of it. Yep. the uh, external perimeter of the... Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, it's got little slices in it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, so that's a patent uh, which was in the end of our supplier... Um, and uh, this patent was made uh, uh, to control the first uh, breaking of the cone. Uh, so the first uh, breaking of the cone uh, um, happened in the perimeter of the circular uh, uh, membrane. And if you break that, that resonance, you have a, a more clear mid-range reproduction. You can measure that. I mean, we have measure of, uh, of we have evidence of that. Um, but normally, the, the cones that use that technology, that patent, are covered by the suspension. Okay. So ultimately, what you are uh, gaining in doing that cuts is covered by the rubber of the membrane. In, in this case, we, we wanted to put the membrane on the back, so all the surface of the cone is completely exposed. Uh, and also we glued the suspension, not on the perimeter of the cone, but slightly inside, which means that the external part of the, of the cone, about two millimeters, are completely free from any, from any glue, from any suspension, from any damping. Um, this was uh, scaring for the engineers at the, at the beginning because nobody did this uh, before. But then we discovered that uh, by measuring a normal cone uh, versus this uh, new camellia cone, what this is what we call him, um, there was evidence that uh, that 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 solution was working better than uh, than the old one. Uh, so first of all, the uh, the membrane is not circular and is completely exposed. Second thing, uh, the motor is a dual motor, uh, uh, dual drive uh, uh, mid range, which is the first of its kind. Nobody did this before. Uh, the right, dual no mid range anywhere. No mid range anywhere. The uh, okay. dual the dual drive technology was. 
uh, was invented by JBL back in the day to control uh, the excursion of uh, the big woofers, uh, like a 15-inch uh, big drivers. Um, also because, uh, um, of course, they were going to use those drivers in, uh, in uh, you know, pro, pro installations so where you need to have a lot of control. So we said, what, what, what if we apply those rules of control and dynamic to a mid-range? What we will gain from that? Uh, we did some tests. Uh, we had to play with the uh, weight of the coils because uh, uh, with a dual drive motor, you are using double the coils, which is not uh, what you really want in a mid-range to, to increase the weight of the unit. So we had to reduce the weight of the two coils. Uh, but what we discovered from the first listening was that the accuracy of that mid-range, the resolution of that mid-range was really unexpected so for for us was the perfect way to balance the natural property of the paper which is the one to uh to make the sound smoother let me say um and not aggressive like uh, aluminium or titanium or beryllium or carbon fiber uh, so we obtained a, a very high resolution and high level of control out of a paper membrane just using this uh, double coil uh, system. Plus, we coupled the uh, two coils with uh, voice coil made out of titanium, uh, which in combination with paper is, again, helping the uh, overall balance uh, of the driver in the sound reproduction to have resolution and to don't lose uh, the beauty of the, the, the tonality of paper. So just to be clear, because somebody's going to jump all over, the actual dual motor system has been done before. JBL invented it, right? Yep. But not for mid-range. Not That's for That's what mid you're saying. Not for mid-range. So this is the first of its type for mid-range. That's what you're yes. saying. Yes. Uh, okay. Exactly. Yeah. And, and the reason why nobody really uh, did it uh, before was uh, mainly uh, cost and production issues. Because, uh, um, of course, in a buffer all the uh, dimensions are, are are huge, are big, and so easy to control. In a mid-range, we are playing with a coil uh, which has zero point something uh, thickness, and uh, they must be completely aligned, uh, and uh, uh, they have to play at the same distance from the magnet to work properly. If you have uh, uh, millimeters of tolerance there, the mid-range will not play at all or play with a high distortion. So uh, it's a very critical component. But when we, we did the listening test again, we discovered that there is a, there is a lot more information in that mid-range than a classic one. Okay, so for anybody looking at the speaker, the highest most frequencies are handled by that super tweeter. Then the high-ish frequencies are handled by the bigger dome tweeter. Then the mid-range-ish frequencies are handled by that white not quite circular cone, which hands off to the link woofer below it, which all runs into the base and meets up with those four woofers on the front. And then the lowest base is handled by the subwoofer or subwoofers. But you've also then got a tweeter and a mid-range on the back. Yes. And this is kind of like you've done this with the AIDA, which this looks like, but I, I'm going to point out that all this is new from the AIDA. None of the Sonus Faber speakers have these drivers. I know that. So yes. explain why you've still got drivers on the back then. Um, so the reason why we did it on the AIDA was because, uh, um, again, when you are dealing with a big speaker, what happened is that you are masking with the shape of the speaker part of the dispersion of the mid-high frequencies. Um, bass is almost omnidirectional, but uh, mid-high frequencies are not. So the, um, the, the reason why there is a speaker on the back uh, of AIDAS and also on Suprema is that uh, we wanted to have a, almost a perfect sphere of dispersion in the mid-high range around the speaker. And uh, So it fleshes out the sound power response. The bass is omnidirectional, the mid-range and highs aren't, and it gets increasingly directional. So it's to yes. provide more mid and high frequency information, right? 
uh, in, not only in terms of, uh, of quantity. Uh, actually, we, we had to tune the uh, mid-range and Twitter on the back to don't interfere with the front because you can also decide to switch uh, the, the, the back completely off. Mm. Uh, if, your room, if your room is very high reflective, maybe you don't want to add the dispersion pattern. Um, so the, 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 the mid-range and tweeter on the back are tuned to don't interfere with the frequency response of the speaker. They only add dispersion. So they only add um, energy in the mid-high uh, frequency in the region uh, of the room where the front tweeter and mid-range are not playing. Ah, okay. Okay. And you can turn them on or off but can you kind of dial them down and sure. up is it kind of is, yeah. is it I, I i don't remember now if we have four or five position for the back uh, emission uh and we have experience with aida uh, that in some rooms in our in our customers uh, uh houses uh, they might be uh, able to 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 have different settings for from left and left and right to obtain the right uh, stabilization of uh, of the sound stage. So okay, I think I think I've asked enough technical questions for now. I asked a lot. I just asked one more. It, it's a, it, the the subwoofer and the main column are rated at four ohm impedance. Yep. Do they go brutally low in impedance? Do you need like a brutish amplifier or what can you get away with? No, the beauty of uh, of designing drivers in home uh, is that you can adjust the impedance of each driver coil to uh, the project you are going to do. So there is no, uh, there is no um, very hard peak to control. Uh, but of course, uh, we are talking of a very ambitious system. The crossover design is quite complicated because we we are applying our our uh, know how of uh, uh, relative phases alignment, and this means that there are quite uh, uh, an amount of uh, components. Uh, uh, just to control the face behavior of the drivers. Um, so, uh, of course, it's not, uh, I cannot see it's an easy speaker to drive. Uh, you, you need some serious amplifier, but it's not, uh, it's not a killer, uh, let me say. And, and I'm saying this one with tongue and cheek. Can you only use Macintosh amplifiers with it? <laughs> Everybody's going to think that because you showed it in Vegas with a whole stack of Macintosh stuff, and they'll say, "Oh, I need to buy all these Macintosh amplifiers." But I'm assuming you can use other brands amplifiers <laughs> with it. Yes, of course. We we tested the speaker with many uh, brands of uh, amplifiers. Was the, the the beauty of having Macintosh uh, uh, with us in this development was that, uh, uh, of course, we had to we 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 could benefit from uh, the presence of the output transformers in some cases where you need to have uh, um, uh, that balance in the in the overall performance, um, but. We tested them with uh, with standard amplifiers, uh, low power amplifiers, tube amplifiers. Really, I mean, that's the beauty of our of our game, right? Is to to have the possibility to play with amplifiers. And, uh, well, ex stuff. exactly, and I think that's going to make other companies happy because people do get this idea when something is shown with something at a show, and then you show it twice or three times, they think, oh, that's the only products that go together. But yeah, you've yeah, designed yeah. this speaker system. To be compatible and, with them. Yeah, and also regarding the uh, choice of amplifiers, um, we didn't mention uh, about the crossover network. Uh, that the uh, reason why we did the crossover in that way is because we know that uh, the active this, crossover for the sub and the speaker. The active yeah. crossover. Sorry. Yes. Um, is because we know that. Um, our customer will place that crossover in the middle of a preamplifier and an amplifier, mm -hmm. which normally for that range of, uh, of customers will be uh, very expensive stuff. Um, maybe uh, some cube design uh, for the, for the preamplifier especially. So 
uh, when we thought about the crossover, the easiest way to do it was to convert all the, si the signal in digital, do a DSP low pass and high pass, and then uh, convert again to the to the end. That that was uh, the, the easiest easiest way. But of course, we didn't want to do that, so we we went old fashioned uh, and we designed a complete analog dual mono discrete component crossover, which means uh, resistors and capacitors only. So um, even if you have a complete and full analog chain from the top to the bottom, uh, this crossover is not adding any uh, digital conversion, any DSP uh, magic on, on your signal. And just so Jordan knows, because he's relatively new to hi-fi, old school audio files, kind of don't like digital magic in a lot of cases, even in places it might make sense or not, but this is a pure analog system. That's what you're saying. Yep. So yep. Doug, I'm glad you brought that up because I was actually going to ask a question right along those lines. I think right now uh, that was a fascinating intro to the, the deep dive tech. Let's take a break. And when we come back, we're going to uh, try and get Livio to switch his brain from, from left to right, uh, get a little bit more into the, the higher level stuff on this speaker and the project and uh, what this means for Sonos Faber. So okay. we'll be right back. Welcome back to the Soundstage Audio File podcast. Uh, we have Livio from Sonos Faber with us. We have just gone really deep into the technical specs of the new Suprema speaker system. Um, I want to bring this back and kind of ask a little bit more about this project from a higher level. Um, I, I guess, Livio, the first thing that I think of when I see um, new speaker systems in this price range is, was this project started because of demand from existing customers that were looking for something more? Or is this Suprema project kind of like an invitation to new customers that you may not have already serviced that you kind of want to give the absolute best that's out there too? To be completely honest with you, uh, we had no marketing thought when we started this project, uh, just because as I said to Doug before, um, the reason uh, why we did the project was uh, just because the uh, level of, uh, of new ideas in the lab was so high that we wanted to condensate that in a, in a project. And we started that project, uh, agreed with the CEO uh, to be no compromise. So he said, uh, go spend whatever you want I want just to have the best of the best. Um, so uh, also the original price point we had in mind when we start this, uh, we started this project was uh, was about half of that, honestly. <laughs> uh, but uh, but really, when uh, when when you have a group of passionate people uh, working in the R and D, and they are also audiophiles, and you and you tell them you have no limits. <laughs> you know, they'll push that theory. You, you, you push that theory to a level which is uh, almost uh, uh, not possible to control. Uh, so when we when we had the final prototype, we, we went uh, in front of the CEO and the new owners and we said, well, this is what we 
this is what we design. Um, let's see if uh, there is a market for this kind of uh, monster. And uh, and the reply from our sales uh, chain was positive. Uh, they all said, uh, uh, if the speaker is performing like uh, you are promising, we will we will have a market for that. Um, so uh, in this case, all the process was uh, uh, was uh, upside down. Let me say we started from scratch, and uh, and when we arrived to a point where we were satisfied we said okay let's 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 produce it i so i find that absolutely fascinating because it's this idea that you're not manufacturing something you're not coming up with something based on like a, a salesperson notes over the years or something like that you're really coming up with something that's completely driven by the passion of the people that are designing and making it yeah, um, and just to add something to that, when we invited a restricted uh, uh, a group of uh, distributors and dealers and uh, people that we trust to listen to Prima and uh, especially people that uh, deal with this kind of uh, super high-end uh, uh, crazy speakers, we had a fantastic feedback uh, saying that uh, uh, Suprema was really special among the the, the competitor, uh, and so uh, we 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 uh, uh, we found that with Suprema we can can all uh, can also uh, establish uh, the 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 name of Sonus Faber in a higher category uh, and play the game of uh, of uh, the best of the best. So that to me is fascinating. It leads me to this other idea, which is. You mentioned when uh, you were talking to Doug, you, you mentioned it a few times, the old fashioned approach to things. And I find that there's a really neat juxtaposition between the old fashioned approach that you have, but then you have like some of the newest materials or, or a driver that's never really been made before. So there's this old fashioned approach with the absolute pinnacle of technology, design, uh, materials, all of that stuff. So was this always going to be in, intended to be like an analog system? And and was there ever a thought of a digital uh, processor in there to kind of make your lives easier? Or, or were these fundamentals that you and the designers were saying like, no, like this is what we want? Yeah, of course we had, uh, we were tempted by, you know, using a class D amplifier and a D digital DSP for the subwoofer. That would be much easier um, in the digital domain you can do almost everything um, but when you when you listen uh, um, a pair of subwoofer like those uh, when you when first of all when you have big surfaces big uh, radiation surfaces like a 4 15 inch you don't really need to have equalization you don't need it to have uh, uh, a digital EQ that is compensating the lack of uh, of uh, um, or, um, surface or the lack of volume inside the box. Um, so this was uh, uh, a reason why we 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 were able to go uh, full analog. Um, plus, when you hear a system like that. Uh, moved by uh, classic AB amplifiers, uh, very powerful, of course, amplifiers, and uh, no digital in between the signal. I think the performance are 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 really are really different and really um, uh, interesting for 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 the audience in particular. That's an interesting point to Jordan, actually, is because not that digital can't do great things, but oftentimes digital is used as a problem solver to the laws of physics. So you need a certain sure. cabinet volume to produce the base of driver, goes along with the cabinet volume and this. So you get some mini subwoofer and you don't have the driver size or the cabinet volume. Yeah. Or you have a big woofer in a little box and you don't have the volume. So you use the digital to kind of crank things up and force it to do what physics won't allow you to do. You know, you kind exactly. of defy the laws of physics by by forcing things. So what you're saying, Livio, is you just made it as big as you needed to. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and when you do this, you have, uh, uh, you have the possibility to work with drivers that are 
uh, uh, not uh, moving like crazy uh, because you know if if you if you put a, a, a long excursion buffer in a very small box, you have to push with the EQ at a level that that buffer is doing meters of uh, excursion. Uh, if you measure that, it it will give the twenty hertz. But those t- 20 hertz are not the same 20 hertz of a big woofer, which is not moving. Uh, it's, a, it's a complete different feeling. You can feel that 20 hertz in your body uh, instead of having just the feeling that something is happening but doesn't, it's, not, it's not really realistic. Uh, when you have this wall of sound moving air in front of you, it's a feeling you have in the big concert where, where you have these, you know, 18 inches that are pushing, uh, in front of you. Well, I was, uh, at for coffee with Dr. Floyd Toole the other day, and I was talking to him about psychoacoustics and I said, do you think that we'll get to a point where, um, you know, we'll trick people into hearing, for example, deeper bass by doing something psychoacoustically. The bass isn't really there. And he said, well, you already do that. He said, if you give someone the harmonics of a bass frequency, their brain will think they're hearing the bass frequency. However, he said, you won't actually feel the bass frequency. Yeah, the, 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 there, is a, there is a pretty famous uh, software that everybody, uh, everybody in the industry will use to to create that harmonics in uh, in small uh, active speakers. Um, so uh, it's uh, you have the feeling, and that's okay if you are listening uh, uh, music, uh, um, uh, you know, in a, in, a, in, a, in a random environment. It's 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 fine, but if you want to really really hear what an orchestra can do uh, in a in a dedicated listening room, you need to have those big surface that really play Move that. The air. Move the air. Yeah. Now, so, and you mentioned it a couple times about kind of the materials that are used for the the drivers and all of that. One material that you kind of mentioned, and I don't want to get too technical because I can't, and I think Doug did a really good job covering that. But you mentioned cork as the one of the internal materials. Is this um, like is this a novel material to use in speakers, and what? What kind of led you to, to using cork? I, I just find that fascinating. Um, so to to explain why we we headed to that uh, to that decision to that material, uh, we have where to exactly is to, the cork used, Livio? Yeah, it's see. the mid range. It's the mid range enclosure. Ah, uh, inside the cabinet. Inside the cabinet, because the the, the uh, mid range enclosure plus the two tweeter, that element in the middle of the speaker can also rotate. It's tiltable. And a oh. so it's oh, an independent. Oh yeah, it's an independent chamber, and it's uh, activated from the back of the speaker uh, to be tilted and oriented to the listener position. Well, that's oh, kind of a big thing I missed, isn't it? <laughs> okay, <laughs> yeah, okay. And this is going to lead me to a million other questions. Uh, but it, sorry, cork. so the uh, the cork. Where did cork come from? And the cork come from from uh, our necessity to. Um, push the boundaries of uh, internal reflection uh, a little bit further. We, uh, Sonos Faber was, uh, uh, not all, not all uh, uh, the people knows that Sonos Faber was the first uh, inventing the lute shape uh, back in the day with the Guarneri, uh, the first Guarneri homage. Lute shape is that shape that uh, basically now uh, all the speakers have where you don't have parallel walls left and right they are not boxed uh enclosure they are uh they have these uh these uh, organic shape that goes from uh, front to the back uh sonos faber was the first to introduce that and uh, and, and franco serbli the, f- the founder was the first to understand the benefit of having uh, non-parallel walls inside the cabinet and when, when what year are we talking uh 90 i think it was 92 93 Mm, okay. But in the lute design cabinet, you have two non parallel walls, but then top and bottom, they are parallel walls. Um, so, with Suprema and especially with the mid range, we wanted to create a, uh, the perfect shape to control the back radiation of the driver. 
And to uh, create that shape, we used uh, um, computer simulators uh, like console uh, softwares that can simulate the behavior of, uh, of a shape uh, with any kind of physics, so liquids or acoustics. Um, and uh, of course, the result was a complete uh, organic shape, not a box, yeah. not a circular one. Uh, but something very organic. And so we had at that point, we had the problem how we can create that shape out of um, a natural material because we are famous for natural materials. We, we want to use natural materials. We believe yeah. in natural materials. So we uh, also in that case was, was easy to, uh, to use plastic or carbon fiber or any kind of composite material to create the shape. But that was not sans faber. So um, uh, eventually I was, I was walking in, uh, in a showroom that was uh, showing uh, uh, wood veneers one day. And they had this, uh, this big brick. Uh, it was like a giant Lego brick made out of cork. And so I asked it to the to uh, to the owner of the showroom was was that, and he said it's uh, it's just a demonstration of a new technology um, coming from Portugal, where all the cork is produced um, to give a second life to the cork. So oh, interesting. Yeah. So basically, uh, I don't know how much you are familiar with cork, but cork uh, itself, it's, uh, it's an amazing material. It's, uh, it's water resistant, it's fire resistant, uh, and it has a, a beautiful acoustic properties. In fact, uh, most of the time is used to dump the uh, studio recording uh, uh, walls. Um, and uh, and uh, basically, this company is uh, buying back all the uh, wine caps. Okay. And, and, uh, they are doing a powder out of that. They are uh, machining all of them and they are creating a powder and then mixing that powder with, uh, uh, with the resin, the, the, the original resin of the cork. And so they, they do, um, uh, um, a sort of, uh, fluid that it's uh, possible to be molded. That is fascinating. So not only is this uh, a natural material, but it's also essentially like an upcycled material or a recycled um, cork it's process. Reci it's, it's actually recycled. And uh, the, the cork itself, it's very sustainable because those uh, plants that produce cork, they renovate themselves every eight years. So it's a completely sustainable material. Uh, but also, uh, but, but, but there is the problem of the waste, right? The waste yeah. of all these cups. Um, and uh, for our uh, application, that material was absolutely perfect because it was uh, uh, natural, it was sustainable, and it was uh, moldable. So we can obtain uh, uh, the, the, the shape we designed with 3D software. Um, and we did test it. And um, the surprise was also that by the material, by the, nat the nature of the material, the that shell made of cork is also very well damped. And so we had the possibility to reduce a lot the using of damping material inside the enclosure, with the result that we are using more energy uh, coming out of the mid range. To contribute to the final result, and um, this is something that we want to use in the future. This is uh, the, this cork enclosure will be present in uh, in our future development because also it's something that you can do in larger scale, which was another another target of the project. Because if you produce a technology which is amazing, but you cannot use uh, in in normal speakers. Uh, What's, what's the meaning of that, right? Yeah, th that was actually another one of my questions. And it's this idea that some of these flagship products are so great, but if the, the rest of the line doesn't benefit from the technology that's used, maybe not all of it. Like, obviously, there, there's probably a large amount that um, is just not financially feasible to bring down to uh, another range of speakers. But this technology that's in the Suprema is going to... Uh, essentially make its way, or at least some of it is going to make its way into other future projects from Sonos Faber. 
Yeah, and that's exactly the reason why we wanted to do this speaker. Because when you have in the hand all this technology uh, and all these new ideas, to make those ideas at the service of the company, you have to experiment that, you have to make them a reality. Uh, and uh, a project like Suprema was the best way to do them. Uh, and then you have to uh, use them uh, in, a, in, a, uh, in a different maybe shape and, and, uh, and, and quantities in your classic line of loudspeakers. With, with this in mind, um, these are not, and, and it's even clearly said on the, on the site, like these are bespoke products. Uh, they're they're kind of customized to the, the purchaser's preference. If somebody were to order one of these today, a Suprema yeah. system, uh, they make all the choices for the specific materials and colors and, and finishes and all that. Um, what what is the the kind of process like or the manufacturing process the timeline to actually build a set of suprema speakers to do the quick answer uh, when we have uh, uh, the system uh, specified uh, we took uh, between 4 to 5 months to build uh, to build a pair from uh, from scratch wow. uh, but uh, when we decided to go on the market with Suprema, we designed uh, two uh, different services that we call experiences that goes with the product. First of all, uh, the customer intended to buy a pair of Suprema is invited in Sonos Faber to spend three days with us. Uh, and we will, of course, cover the expenses for, for him and, uh, and, and another member of his family to stay with us three days in Italy. Uh, one day will be dedicated to um, training on the speaker and the system. Uh, the other day is dedicated to do the complete uh, uh, customization, meaning that the customer will sit down with designers and he will be able to decide which color of uh, which grain of wood he wants to uh, to apply to the to, to the wood parts, uh, the color of the aluminum, uh, the um, texture of the carbon fiber, um, color of the carbon fiber. It's also customizable too. Um, and the uh, choices of uh, leathers, which are provided by Poltrona Frau for us, or different materials, because we also uh, did a pair with Alcantara, um, which is the material used in the hypercars uh, interiors. Um, so uh, the third day is dedicated to uh, an amazing Italian experience with, uh, uh, with you know, the, the fine the fine restaurants and, and, the, fi and the amazing historical yeah, place. Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to jump in here because this really kicks ass because <laughs> I see these big speakers and, you know, I think to myself, well, I hope it comes with something more. Now, if any rich person is listening, I've been to the Sonus Faber area a few times and I would go in a heartbeat, you know, to see that again. So you're not going out to, you know, some industrial park in the middle of an, you know, big American city. You're going to a really cool place. So that would be great for three days. Yes. It's a lot like the White Lotus season two without all the <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. an amazing <laughs> show. It's not the less expensive way to to have a trip in Italy, but uh, it's uh, it's still a nice experience, right? Well, well uh, I think that's something that seems to maybe have gotten missed or sidelined when when the speaker was announced and when the a lot of people talk about the price and like price in general. Um, I understand that it's very high, but there's a lot of things that kind of build up to get the price to what it is, and the fact that you guys are kind of giving that whole experience through the design and just kind of showing i'm going to say the culture of sonas faber through that that trip that adds to the the value that somebody is getting out of these speakers yeah absolutely i mean it's uh, uh it's uh, and and that's know that very very well the value of companies like Sonos Faber, we are not the only one, but uh, is the fact that uh, the dimension of the company, uh, and in our case also the location of the company, um, explain why our products are so special, uh, better than any marketing activities, better than any video uh, advertise or something like that. Um, because you see the actual people uh, 
uh, assembly those speakers with the hands um, and there is nothing automized everything is made uh, uh, human level let me say um, okay. and uh, and uh, and there is this culture in the company uh, for perfection uh, which which is very fascinating I, I mean was very fascinating for me the first time I visited the company so I, I guess it's fascinating also for uh, for other people. It, and for somebody that um, may want to listen to these, yes. uh, you right now are in the McIntosh townhome in New York. Is is New York going to get a set of Supremas uh, installed as uh, part of the listening experience? Or, or where else can you actually listen to a set of Supremas? Well, um, of course, the townhouse would be the first. Uh, the pair that uh, were uh, were demonstrated in Vegas are coming here, and okay. uh, they will be installed in the main room uh, at the townhouse. But we have also um, several showrooms uh, and uh, and shops that will uh, will have Suprema on demonstration uh, before summer. So. USA will be covered uh, soon. Uh, will be the, the speaker will be introduced in the Shanghai uh, show in April. Uh, so we will see how many of our of our dealers will uh, will uh, buy Suprema for uh, for demonstrating it. Uh, and of course, Sonus Faber is always available to uh, to have guests. And I'm, I'm in. I'm in. Yeah. Yeah. Doug, let's, uh, let's get a trip out to Italy. Uh, I hear there's some good views, um, <laughs> and great speakers to listen to Livio. I, I don't want to take up too much more of your time. I know this, and I can imagine Dennis is probably saying that this is going to be a long episode to edit even to begin with. Um, if you were to sit somebody down in front of the set of Supremas and say, this is the music that I think you should listen to because I love it so much, not, not, just to demo them from a technical level, but what music at a pure enjoyment would you want somebody to listen to on a set of Supremas? I would, uh, if, if you really want to have the, my, 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 my honest answer, I would flip the uh, question to the listener because I believe that uh, uh, to experience the level of resolution and power of that speaker, you have to listen to something that you know very well to understand how different will sound through that system. Um, what that, if you're the listener? So if you're the listener and you want to hear something that you absolutely love, um, what would that be? Uh, I think uh, so something from the Radiohead. From Radiohead. Oh, that is a great answer. I never I expected it. that. <laughs> yeah, uh, the, those are probably the uh, the, the, the the tracks that uh, are more more linked to to my uh, experience with uh, with iFi. Um, some of those uh, those recordings are really well well made, and the music is spectacular. And it's uh, it's not easy to 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 find good recordings uh, uh, with good music in it. Uh, sometimes, so uh, Radiohead they are really uh, they are really one of my favorite when it comes to um, uh, emotional listening. I love it. I already have a lot of Radiohead on my uh, on my playlist, so I'm I'm really happy you said that. I'm going to listen to it as I drive uh, for the yeah. rest of the day. Then we we what we said during the uh, demonstration in uh, in Vegas is that a speaker like Suprema, uh, especially with that system connected to, uh, has to perform basically everything. Uh, so we played from uh, uh, acoustic jazz to uh, pure voices. Um, two big orchestras, but also we had requests of uh, heavy disco tracks, and uh, and we played them, uh, and we had a lot of fun. Um, I think this industry has to be more humble with the music selection. Sometimes uh, we 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 pretend that uh, uh, all our listeners are uh, classic music listener or just music listener, but that's 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 too limiting. I I love that idea because for me, 
uh, hi-fi at the end of the day is really about kind of getting the most out of the music that you are passionate about. So I love it. I agree 100% with that, 100%. Livio, thank you so much uh, for taking the time. I know this was uh, quite a long episode to record, so I really, really appreciate it. Um, is there anything else that you want to say anywhere that you would want to direct people uh, that are listening uh, to kind of check out uh, just as we close up? Well, uh, as, as we said, I think uh, anyone who wants to do a Suprema experience is invited to reach out to the uh, House of Sound here in New York. Uh, Ricky here will, uh, will uh, take care of, uh, of you and uh, let you having a, a, an amazing experience, uh, which is not related only to the music. I mean, the house is pretty spectacular. Um, so I, I, I invite everyone can uh, can visit uh, here the place to, to do it. Thank you so much, Livio. And thank you, Doug. Sorry. Thank you, Doug, as well for uh, for jumping in. Yes, and thank I want to thank Livio for getting on with the tough questions. They needed to be asked and uh, he answered everything. That's good. Even if I'm designer and not uh, an acoustic guy, <laughs> so I. Hey, I, why don't you give a shout out to your team? Who are the guys who designed this speaker? Because it wasn't you who designed the whole thing. So uh, in this case, we the, the, the team was pretty pretty large. Uh, Mario Passarelli he was of course in charge of the overall acoustic uh, uh, of the project. He designed it every driver from scratch uh, plus of course he, 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 he gave direction to the mechanical design designers to draw, uh, to design the enclosure uh, Marco Trentin he is with me from uh, the beginning of my adventure with the company he designed it with me AIDA uh, and so he was in charge of mechanical design of, uh, of this, uh, this huge piece um, you know Alberto Demel uh, my right uh, hand and in, in design, he he's, he's responsible of most of the industrial design on the on the on the on the speaker, um, and everyone in the acoustic department made his contribution because we made a, a, several listening uh, session with different crossovers and a, a anyone anyone contributed to that so uh florian andrea uh, all of uh, the acoustic guys uh were part of the project and uh, I'm, I'm really proud of them amazing thank you so much take care everyone and all the best ciao bye bye ciao